Okay. I think you can hear me now. Let's give this this another try, shall we? And um, Heavenly Father, I pray and ask that this would not only be working, but that, Lord, it would be helpful in equipping people. In Christ Jesus, holy and precious name, I do pray. Amen. Yeah, I think it's working now. Okay, I want to talk tonight about breaking up the foundations of the monarch. Um, I'm going to be using the term monarch quite a bit because it's to describe monarch mind control foundation. Uh, monarch mind control programming is associated with it, but also everyone coming out of the occult or that has cult ties. And um, let me see. So we'll find out if the microphone's working this time. All right. So, Father, I do pray and ask once again, would you equip the helpers, the counselors, and Lord, would you see people come to freedom? In Christ Jesus, holy and precious name I pray. Amen. So what I want to discuss tonight is the foundation of what's called monarch mind control programming. Also, anybody that's been programmed or conditioned or that is a high-level dissociate because of cultic ties, um, cultic lineage, you know, where the scriptures are very clear, the sins of the father shall be visited to the children of the third and the fourth generation of those that hate me. And, of course, the word for sin there, um, sawyer, means a devil a dark covering, and something that seeks to keep you from knowing truth and light. So when you work with an individual, and last time we discussed the induction method, and I, I like to use going to the valley, but if the valley doesn't work or they can't visualize it, I always trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and we covered this to speak to them, because he is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He is the Curion Aletheia, which means the Lord of all truth. And he reveals truth, especially to his children. Now, here's the thing. Um, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we must believe that he is, and that is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So I believe in the power of God. I believe God wants to set people free, because that's what the scripture says. So the foundation of a monarch comes through what's called the Shabuah when it becomes the Sheba. Okay, now this is two Hebrew words. The first one, the Shabuah, is when a person makes an oath. Except they don't, uh, 29 times it's used in the scriptures talking about God making an oath with himself. Because when God makes an oath, he's eternal, he's outside of time. It consists for all eternity. When a human does it, for instance, they, they make a sacrifice and dedicate a child, the child will be the pledge. And they will dedicate the child as a living sacrifice, not as a dead sacrifice. A living one to the god Molech. And it's a pledge. And the Shabuah itself is where they pledge themselves and their family lineage for all time and eternity to an unholy entity like the devil or Satan and um, or Ishtar or Ashtaroth. You, you name the entity, they all are fallen. Now, here's the thing. When the person, the first one, makes the pledge, He begins the process. But when seven of the people in that family line have made the pledge, it becomes a Sheba. Sheba means the well of the seven oaths. It means it becomes a source of perpetual regeneration. So a person will be born with this pledge already enacted and working in them. To this day, they still make these pledges. And whether you join the Masonic Lodge, 
the Eastern Star. Um, there are many different groups, but in all Satanism, devilry, devil worship, cultic lines, Haitian voodoo, um, you know, I've, I've worked with people from every point of the world, and they all have the one thing in common. It began when one ancestor made an oath and then pledged the family line. So why is this important? And why is it so hard to, to get out of somebody? Well, this is the reason. That pledge begins what's called the dynasty or what we call the lineage of death. You see, Jesus Christ is the God of all life. He is the life giver. He is the one from which all life comes from. But Satan is the life taker. And he is the God of death. He seeks to separate you. And that's what the name Sawir or the sins of the fathers being visited. It is that which seeks to separate you. Oh, thanks for letting me know, Gene. I was, I was getting worried. <laughs> he seeks to separate you from the God of life. Jesus Christ is light. Satan is darkness. He is the exact opposite, the polar opposite of everything that the Lord is. So when they make when they make that first pledge, it begins the process of what's called establishing a dynasty. When six do it in a row, it becomes those six rocks because it's and that's why if you've got that copy of the book Making the Monarch, you'll see six different stones under the feet. The seventh is the actual mountain in the back. And the mountain is called Paramount in the English, but in the Hebrew it's called Fanuel, and it means the place of the two mountains. Because what happens is the brain becomes split, and on one side of the brain will be all of the darkness, and on the other side will be the light. Now, here's the sad thing. The light side will be ruled by the, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.16, that God made basically two angels, the one to rule by day, you know, two lights, one to rule by day, one to rule by night. And that is Satan and Astaroth, one of darkness. And you could say it's the moon or the North Star. There's people that argue over this. And then there's the one that represents the sun. He's not the sun. He wants to be the sun. So here's what happens. Six foundational stones are set, but when the seventh does it, it creates the fanual, which is where the blind is split, and you'll see it as two mountains, one mountain here and one mountain here. And in between them is where the energy source, it's usually seen as a lightning bolt, or in ancient pagan family lines, they will see a river of water. And that is because that's where the throne sits. It sits right in the center here of the head. And then from that, it will emanate the unholy covering of the Ur, the iron soft, iron soft Ur, the three unholy spirits. And they will take, try, uh, they, their job is, is to keep you separated as a dark covering. In Egyptian uh, pantheon magic, it's called the veil of Isis. But in Babylonian magic, Medio Persian, in Every type of magic, it is a veiling of the mind. Now, and I'll just throw this in. Many of the rituals that they do, for instance, they'll pierce the ear of the child and they'll take and, and poke the thumb and the big toe to draw blood and they will do the opposite. They will pray that that child is never, never able to hear the words from the true and the living God. So they... It's hard to believe, but because the parents are all in, they will give their child over in a ritual, blaspheming the name of, of Jesus Christ and God the Father, and saying they never want their child to hear his word. They never want his hand to do his work. They never want his foot to go where he's gone. They try to condemn the child. That's one of the rituals that they do. But the foundation is when six individuals in the family line give themselves over 
The seventh creates the Shiva, and that's the source of well, which is when children are now going to be born with the Nephilim in them. At conception, when the cells split, the second cell gets the Nephilim or the fallen angel. So that starts the foundation upon which everyone's feet will rest, and it is the false rock. Because you see, Jesus Christ is the rock that we all stand upon. He lifts us out of the miry clay that will seek you know, quicksand to consume us slowly, taking our life and ultimately leading to our death. But he gives us life and places our feet upon the rock, and he keeps us there. So that is how the Sheba starts. But then the Sheba, you're going to notice there are four boxes. One, two, three, four. And you'll notice they each have if you study China, Chinese, I Ching, that's the I Ching down there. Do you understand that? So it's in every language. So it's in Hebrew, and then you'll see it in the Chinese, the I Ching. Now, what is that? That means four sealed boxes coming together, creating a completely different person. Who are those four boxes? It is when... Here's the child. Say it's me. It would be my mom, my father, their mothers and fathers each. Those two on each side. So it goes to the grandparents to me. Those are the four boxes, two from each side. Now, what are those four boxes? Those four boxes are the Ark of the Unholy Covenant. So, Six make the oath. When the seventh does, it splits the mind, puts the throne of Zeus, Lucifer, Satan, Baal, whatever you want to call him, right here over the crown of the head, and it'll look like a stream of water flowing down. His throne will be hidden up there. The two mountains are the left and right hemisphere of the brain. And it flows all the way down through the person, central and peripheral nervous system controlling every aspect of their being. It yokes unholy seraphim to their whole to their spirit. So the six, the seventh one creates the mountain range that surrounds it. And that's called Paramore. If you ever watch TV, you'll see the stars all come down and touch the water that flows from Lucifer's throne. And then they'll go up and surround the mountain. Why? And you'll notice they'll usually have 24, 12 on each side, mother and father. 12 archangels, 12 archangels joined together, creating 24, serving from the side of Ashtaroth and the side of Satan. That creates a complete temple given over to the God of this world. That creates one box. One unholy ark with four angels on the corners, creating a throne upon which rests the unholy entity. Now, when you have four of those boxes, that creates a lineage that is sealed and given over completely to the God of this world and every child that they have. But it also equips and enables them at that point to bring in others. A pure blood are those whose lineage goes all the way back and it's on the mother's and the father's side and both of their parents. So you see as this web, it looks like an upside down mountain. So how do we get rid of it? You see, that is the foundation. It is where rather than being born with your name in the book of life, you're born with your name in the book of death. Which is why in the carpenter's prayer, you renounce having your name written in the book of death. Most people don't understand. But even in naming the child, the unholy spirits have a part in naming the child. And that is why you are going to find common names. You are going to find the name Rose, Lucy, Marie, which is the ancient Babylonian name for wife of Dagon. You are going to find the Lily, 
is for the lily of the valley. It also speaks of Lilith. It's the Engel interpretation for Ashtoreth. Lucy is through the uh, Medio Persian into the Greek, early ancient Greek, into the Latin via the, the fifth century. It was just being created and um, personified. It started in the, the end of the second century, but it was took on its own meaning. And so Lucy means wife of Lucifer. Okay? So why? They will always have a name, a middle name, depicting who they are wed to or who they have been given to. Now, ones that don't have a middle name tell you that they're pure bloodlines. For instance, did you know the last name Slaughter means worshiper of Molech? But it doesn't just mean a worshiper of Molech. It means one whose family line have been the priests and servants of Molech. I, uh, I, I've i worked uh, with a family line of slaughter, and they were proud because everybody, literally everybody in their family was a member of Mensa. They were geniuses, all of them. But the person told me without batting an eye how they dated their family line all the way back to 1,000 B.C. of worshiping Satan. Yeah, and so I, I led... Um, Actually, just one person out of that family and um, to salvation. And that's when they spilled the beans. And they were speaking in ancient uh, Latin. And I said, what language is that? And the person looked at me and says, that's niter. I said, there's no such language as niter. She says, you think you know a lot. She says, why don't you do a little more research? That's going back 25 years ago. This is before the internet was all blown up. And I had to go to the books and so I went and hit the books. Niter was before Latin, ancient language. She was correct. I looked up the words. She was correct. She educated me. And so I was very thankful that she came out and, and she revealed a whole lot about what I didn't understand or know at the time. So what happens is the child is born condemned. The child is born with already having an unholy Ark of the Covenant in them. And in that unholy covenant is sealed, one, the book of the dead. Two, the false bread of life, which has been urinated on and spit upon and blaspheming the name of Christ. They use it for what's called the bloody Sabbath, the black Sabbath, the unholy Sabbath, the feast to the beast. That is the bread from which was used. And I had a uh, satanic priest who led to salvation. He was in his 60s of the old order priesthood. He was also a grand druid, um, an 80th level mason. He had went through the 33 degrees and then 80 more. And he said, Tom, I had to be a Catholic priest. He says you either have to be a Catholic priest or a Greek Orthodox in order to become a satanic, a pure blood satanic priest. He said, and so I have I was a Catholic priest of the old order for 38 years. Now I led Father Bob to salvation. And he said I would break the bread after or, or offering it unto the true Lord God as a Catholic priest to turn it into the body of Christ. He said, then I would break it, cast it down, spit upon it, step upon it, and then urinate on it and then break it up and put it into the goblet of blood, wine, and urine mixed together to give for the unholy mass. And they would eat that. And it was to desecrate. And so both sides, four boxes, both grandparents coming down to that child. It would be me, my mom and dad, but their grandparents. Both had done that and theirs. And that's what seals it already in. Well, then you have the staff of Toth or Pharaoh. In the box will be Pharaoh's staff. And you'll say, well, what is Pharaoh's staff? You see, in, in the Holy Ark of the Covenant, it was Aaron's rod that budded. There was the manna and there was the book of the covenant of the law. Well, in the unholy Ark, the staff is the spine of the individual. Okay? It is the entire spine and the top is the head. 
And instead of it having almonds and flowers that come out or leaves, it has two snakes wrapped around it or one snake up here at the top, which means it is in the confines or constriction. It is being held. Those are the chains of bondage by the serpent. So, in the unholy ark, we will have the book of the dead. That gives you over to the God of death, which is the foundation, the rocks upon which you stand. You will have the, the false manna, or bread, which is blaspheme the name of Christ, but that symbolizes the Antichrist, the one who takes the place or tries to of the true Lord God. And then you will have the staff, which is the giving over of the central and peripheral, your brain and how your body functions through vows so that the God of this world will hold it and have seraphim wrapped around it. Seraphim are an unholy type of angel that are elemental. But then you have the ark itself, which is your body indwelt by the spirit of Satan, which is witchcraft. It happens through the sealing in, and that's how that is created. And there are four entities, cherubs, that will be holding the four corners of that unholy ark in you. Which is why, if you look at the cover of that book, you'll see an eagle up here, a man here. You go all the way down here, and you will see a lion with wings and a pig or a bull with wings. The lion is the false lion of the tribe of Judah. The bull is, of course, Satan, the false sacrifice for everyone. You know, the ox for all the nation and the world. The man is the false Christ. They all represent the false, false Christ. False eagle. So those are the four cherubs that will be holding that ark of the unholy covenant. The ark of the unholy covenant would be me, myself. It would be my body. So it's born with the Book of the Dead, the manna in your spine. That is for the unholy trinity. Okay? Now the four entities that are over this is death. They're all Satan. The Antichrist at the top. To the right, Satan, witchcraft. To the left, deception, the serpent. Pure bloods will begin with the witchcraft. They began by doing the ceremonies and weaving the what's called witch's web. You see, this is a witch's web when you have both grandparents connecting to that and connecting to the child because it keeps connecting. And a witch's web means where everybody has crisscrossed all the magic and the vows. So the unholy trinity will already be sealed. And that is Satan, Ashtoreth, and Beelzebub. And when that happens, that ark, which is your body, is completely given over to the God of this world. And that's why it's golden, because it's born with an angel in it. Okay, uh, Gina, I think you're the only person on. Do you have any questions? Did I cover that well? Uh, yeah, it is horrifying. It, it's terrible because they willingly want to do that. The longer they serve the unholy God of this world, the more powerful they get. So here's what has to happen. I work through the side of light first because that is the one that has deceived them into believing they're truly born again. But you see, you can't get saved unless you search for God with your whole heart. And those four parts, the three in the ark, they sit in the heart, and the heart itself is the fourth. So the first one breaks it this way, the second one this way, splitting it into four chambers. And the third one indwells it with a seal. So it would be a circle with a square inside. 
So you begin by working on the foundation. Now, amen. Thank you. Now, when you find somebody that's in the water being tortured, that is mind control programming, and they they do that to split the mind. Um, let me ask you a question, Gina. Was was the person about five years old and their head stuck in a toilet or their head being held underwater? Okay. Because here's what they'll do, and they'll make, if it's two sisters, they'll make the one sister do it. Um, actually, it'd be better if you wanted, I would work with them with you, all three of us together, and I would just pull it out and show you how to fix it. Yep, yeah, that's what they do. They'll have the one sister do it to the other one. And if she doesn't, it, it's because the, the child needs to know there's no help for them. And drowning is one of the quickest ways to split the mind and get the mind to go into um, total submission. So that is part of how they do it. But you don't have to work with the parts. You have to ask the Lord to just lift them out, take the water from their lungs, the fear from their body, to put peace upon them, bring healing to that part, and then ask the Lord to destroy completely to annihilate that part and all of its memories, removing it from them and removing the curse and the wedge that was in there. Because they don't need anything integrated that's bad. Um, one of the things that happens, and I, I try to tell counselors this, is if you integrate everything, you're going to integrate some parts that are, are nihilistically horrible. Uh, they are just evil. And I've seen a person do that, and what happens is the individual becomes completely given over to evil. So I don't integrate every part. I don't integrate most of the parts, to be honest. I get rid of most of them because they don't need them, and they don't need to have the memories. So breaking the foundation, Jesus Christ is the hammer described in the book of Isaiah. And he can destroy those. So when you lead them in a prayer, ask them, have them pray and ask God to make the prayer effectual for everyone connected to them throughout all time and eternity to the first person that made the first vow and everyone else that took part in that vow or was under that vow, even going all the way back to Adam, because in their vows they will claim to join themselves to Adam in the original sin. And so you have to ask him to destroy all six of the false rocks of the foundation to sever them from all four of the unholy. Because you, you're going to run into the Book of the Dead seven times. Everything is done in sevens. Um, I had two counselors in a counseling center in New Jersey. Very wonderful men. I, I love them both very much. And they said, Tom, we're working with a person, and we, have, we keep taking this thing out. We found it five times. I said, well, here's the problem. It's seven times, and if you don't get them all in one shot, they reproduce and refill the slots. You see, that's how the spirit of Beelzebub or the Baphomet works. It is a it it replicates or reproduces and it reprograms. So you have to do them all at once. And that is why when I pray, I pray for the mind, body, soul, spirit, will intellect emotions and when you have all seven it takes you then pray for their ability for reasoning because that's the mind control or the baphomet it is all seven of those when they're brought together and controlled it creates the eighth which controls their ability for reasoning okay i'm going to do another one tonight another lecture after this i'm going to take a break and um, it's going to be on addictions because uh, I, I had a psychologist from uh, South America ask me if I would cover one on addictions. You're welcome, Gina. Thank you for joining me. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I feel I've been having a lot of heart problems, but I really feel like these meetings aren't effective or, you know, it's just good to know that, that there's somebody interested. So thank you. I appreciate it. All right. I will let you go and Lord bless you. And I'll see anybody that comes on in about 10 minutes or so.